Weeks of political rumour, Prime Minister Attlee acted. In a heartening week, which brought news of an all-round stepped-up output, 11 ministers were dropped. Psychologically, the timing was good. The Premier's changes were an added stimulant to the people as a fresh determination to beat the crisis emerged. An example of British production ingenuity, which will bring in the dollars, was seen in London. The seven luxury cars were given a send-off by Stafford Cripps and new cabinet boy Harold Wilson. Four Rolls Royces and three Bentleys will make a 20,000-mile tour of the United States to encourage the export drive. Both types of cars are finished and equipped in lavish style. There is no aping of American design. They typify Britain's finest craftsmanship. 315,000 cars of all makes are scheduled for export next year. Only 90,000 will be available for the home market. Products like these will put Britain's name on the world export map. As the nation's industry stepped up production, plans for more factories were going ahead. At the mouth of the River Dee, near Chester, a hundred acres of marshland are being transformed into a factory site. The land is being reclaimed by the latest methods. To assist in this great engineering accomplishment have come 25 Dutchmen, all experienced in the battle of the land versus water. High pressure pumps suck 14,000 tons of water, sand and silt from the riverbed into a mile and a half long pipeline. At the other end lies the area to be reclaimed. This dredger draws up the sand. Towed from Rotterdam, it was specially built to operate in the Dee. However much sand is taken up, the engineers in charge say the tides will replace it all. At the outlet end, the water drains away. A pump blows the sand, compresses it, and leaves a dry surface as smooth as a billiard table. On the new land will be built a steel plant, an outstanding achievement in engineering history. By midweek, the nation had settled down to staggered working hours and a greater section of the public found time to relax. At Wembley, 70,000 of them packed in for Speedway's Cup Final between Wembley Lions and Manchester's Bellevue. The home team set a cracking pace with skipper Bill Kitchen and Split Waterman riding wheel to wheel to keep out Speedway champion Jack Parker. Spectators roared with excitement as, with the Lions in the lead, the last heats came up. Bellevue have won the Cup six times before. Wembley are the league champions. It's a tussle between Speedway's top teams. Final result, a two-point Wembley win. The Speedway's National Cup final was the highlight of the sporting week, but it was news of scientific development that captured the public's imagination. At St. Evelyn in Cornwall, British scientists launch a vital offensive in airspeed research. A twin-engined Mosquito is fitted with a pilotless rocket plane. This is released by the plane at 36,000 feet. Believed to have travelled faster than sound, at a speed of 880 miles an hour, the robot pierced the sonic barrier and gave valuable data to scientists. Meanwhile, at Bristol, we get a first glimpse of the Brabazon transport plane. The 126-ton airliner is transferred for completion to a newly built hangar. More than four million pounds worth of material has gone into giving Britain the world's biggest aeroplane. The 143-foot-long passenger compartment can seat 100 people who will fly the Atlantic in 12 hours. Bristol's Lord Mayor was there to see Air Marshal Corriton name the Brabson. The giant plane is due to fly from London to New York in nine months' time. It'll be a triumph for British aviation. Yet despite the world lead established by British scientists, the nation's difficulties still centred on the people themselves. In Wigan, heart of Lancashire's cotton industry, that simple truth is realised. An example of the spirit needed to aid Britain's recovery is typified by an ordinary housewife Mrs. Nellie Smith. 30 years old, she lives with her husband and two children at 14 Ashcroft Avenue. A few outside her street have ever heard of Mrs. Smith, but of Britain's women, she is typical. Five nights a week, Mrs. Smith and 399 other Wigan housewives work at Eckersley's number three Western Mill. There, from six till 10, 
the 400 work the Wigan Leisure Shift. To the nation, their efforts put the equivalent of 45 miles of cotton cloth on the world's shop counters every week. Yet Mrs. Smith's day is that of any other housewife. After her shopping, she gets the meals for her husband, a cabinet maker. She has the same worries as millions of other women, how to stretch the rations a little further, whether she can patch the children's clothes still more. The Nellie Smiths of Britain don't go back to the mills merely because Stafford Cripps says they should. If you ask her, she'll tell you that the weekly pay packet helps her domestic budget quite a lot. Now there's your tea, and I'm up. Okay, see you, kid. Sure. Nellie Smith worked in the mills once before. She was then 14. After seven years, she got married and that has happened to thousands once employed in the cotton industry. In 1937, 370,000 men and women earned their living in the mills. Today, there are 245,000. Working here, these women are facing the challenge as they did in war. In such a spirit lies Britain's economic salvation. I think this leisure shift's all right, don't you? Yes, I do. It's leaving the old man at home that I don't like. Putting the kids to bed. This lovely shift for the women is the best thing since fireworks. Yeah. Not bad. <laughs> 